and uh, a journal that she helped start herself in 2014, Remote Sensing in Ecology and Conservation. And not content with doing all of that, she's also uh, Secretary uh, of the Conservation Specialist Interest Group for the British Ecological Society and a member of their Equality and Diversity Working Group and their Policy Committee. Um, so I'm looking forward very much to hear Soapbox Science sounds like the scariest thing imaginable as a public engagement activity. So I'm interested to see how people have done it and survived. Thank you very much, Natalie. Thank you. Um, good afternoon or morning. I never know what you do at 12 o'clock. So, <laughs> uh, thank you for coming, uh, for sharing your lunch with me and uh, for um, hearing about uh, something quite personal, a uh, personal story about Soapbox and, and more. Um, so before I, I start on a more general point, I thought that you probably want to know what Subbox Science is. Um, some of you might know, some of you might have never heard about it. Um, so it's a grassroots initiative uh, which basically delivers low-cost, free uh, public outreach events in, uh, in various places uh, in and around cities. Um, and that uh, the, the whole purpose of Subbox is to try to not preach to the converted. So the, the point is that a lot of people that want to hear about science uh, generally go to the museum or they go to uh, the Royal Society summer exhibition. Basically, they, they are already engaged with the topic and then they go and want to learn further. But there is a huge majority of people that really aren't interested in science. And Subbox is trying to get them. <laughs> they try to surprise them in busy shopping centers, busy streets. And even if we just have two minutes of their time, it's basically showing them that one, a scientist doesn't systematically look the way they expect them to look. And two, they might discover or hear something that I find interesting. Um, so we, and I say we because it's a, it's a collaboration from the start. This is something that I co-founded with Sirian Sumner, who is a reader at the University College London. And we started this in 2011 by doing one event uh, on the South Bank uh, in London, inviting 12 women in science from a range of discipline and seniority to stand on sub boxes in the middle of the street and talk, sorry, talk about their science uh, for an hour to anyone that would be happy to stop and just hear a little bit about it. Um, so our events are quite standardized. There are three hours, 12 women, four women per hour. And the whole point is that we try to include as a much diverse possible representation as STEM as possible. So from different disciplines, from different uh, career paths, from different seniority. Uh, all working actively in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. Um, and the, the thing that we are very clear about is that there is no electricity, there is no PowerPoint, there is not all this, which is what's going on right now. And there is no one talking, the other one listening. It's a dialogue. And it's as, as bare minimum as it can be. Um, and to try to basically show that scientists are approachable and you can have a discussion with them. And we find that format to work very well. Um, as you can see from the start, Subbox Science has been uh, created with dual aims. The first one is clearly to improve the visibility of women working in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. But, and, and then the second aim is to bring uh, science to the non-coverted. And what we are trying to achieve is first to challenge the stereotype in society about what a scientist looks like, but also to provide role model to the next generation or the early career uh, people in science who may want to see a, a variety of pathway to success in STEM. Um, as said, it's a collaborative approach for, for a start. There's two co-founders, but it's also a collaborative approach with a lot of different people. With the speakers uh, that come to us to stand on our sub boxes, they are not paid. They come freely, they choose to be there and they, do, and they give their time and sometimes uh, even uh, take some of their funding to try to get the nice props, to try to get people engaged with their science. It's a collaboration with the volunteers. At every event, we have up to 20 people giving their time, taking on a, a, a T-shirt, trying to uh, bring people to hear our scientists, trying to provide information to whoever might have some uh, question, trying to support the scientists 
to make it as, as smooth and enjoyable as possible. A collaboration with a various experts. So here is a, is a picture with Robin Inns, uh, who has been giving his time for, for many years now to try to uh, train our speakers in science communication and in engaging the general public with scientific issue. A collaboration uh, also uh, with a lot of the press, uh, the Learn Society, and basically a lot of organization that give support either in kind or uh, real funding to make this working. Um, with the two main being the Science and Technology Facilities Council, without them we wouldn't be where we are. They have been supporting us since 2014 um, and they have really allowed us to expand and to reach uh, where we are at. And the Zoological Society of London that has always provided the space, the creativity, the opportunities to develop this initiative further. So I said Subbox started in London with one event. Nowadays we are in 20 plus cities across the UK and in seven different countries. Uh, it has grown very well in uh, Canada. Um, this year we, are, we have four events lined up over there. We might have our first one in Tanzania this year, which I'm really looking forward to because I've been working as a conservation biologist over there. And so uh, helping bring a different aspect of what I do over there is, is something that I'm really proud about. Um, we also have been trying to, to go in various European countries. Uh, we managed to be in Germany for the second year running this year, and we might, uh, we probably will have an event uh, in Sweden. So if you look at uh, um, how the, the outreach initiative has been successful, we can, we can say that it's pretty doing quite well. It has been uh, receiving a lot of award. Uh, it has been seen as uh, one of the top uh, 50 most, inno most innovative outreach uh, events uh, by age 2020 um, in the EU and the US. Uh, we got a recognition from the prime minister for the work on uh, Subbox. We got various medals. Um, if you look at Subbox from a number point of view, uh, at the end of this year, we will have had a, nearly a thousand women in science that have actually stepped on our Subboxes and talked to the public about their work. Uh, we have organized so far 49 events in seven countries. We started a website, and, and when I say started, it's literally me having paid and uh, learned about how to set up a website, <laughs> paid for a domain, and try to understand WordPress, which has been an experience in itself. Uh, and that little project has now had over 278 thousand views in more than 60 countries and more than 25 UK outlets have actually covered Subbox Science so far and this is the uh, the growth in the number of events since 2011 so as you can see 2011 12 13 we only had one event in London and then suddenly uh, it started to boom as soon as we uh, secured some uh, funding from the STFC to develop our initiative Um, it has, um, the event works for the attendees too. Uh, it's interesting to know that footfall, well, footfall can vary a lot depending on where you actually put the Suboxion event. Um, in Newcastle, they have set it up right at the exit of the main tube station, which means that their footfall is over 20,000. <laughs> uh, and in some other places, they have, they have gone nearby uh, the beach on a rainy day, and that will get you around 300 people in three hours. Uh, we have 40% of our participants, and so, so far we have been interviewing over 1,200 people that have, uh, that have participated in our event, asking them a, a lot of questions about their experience, what they find interesting, etc. And 40% of them told us that they didn't know about the event before they actually came in, which is exactly what we're trying to do. And this percentage varies a lot. In some places, it's over 80%. In London, now that we've been there for seven years, people expect us. <laughs> <laughs> so they will be there. They know that we will be there. So we can't really catch them by surprise anymore. Uh, I think it's particularly good that 96% say that they enjoy the event and that uh, over 80% said that uh, they would be, they have been inspired to attend something similar in the future. So we might have not changed everything, but we have created a window of opportunity for other to start to engage those people with science uh, and technology. It's appealing to family and kids. We have a lot of uh, our speakers 
take a lot of time to find activities that, that appeal to family in general, which means that some of our attendees easily stay for more than a, an hour. And the feedback uh, include valuing that direct access, that dialogue, the fluidity. You can move from one sub box to the other. You don't have to stay. It's free. It's open air. You can just be there for five minutes, be there for an hour. You just choose. And, and people value that. It has also an impact on our scientists, and we have just been putting together a, a manuscript that has uh, uh, looked at or the impact on over 500 uh, of them. But basically, the stories is that uh, by, by coming uh, to us and by ma making it a challenge, they've gained a bit of confidence uh, in their uh, speaking ability, public speaking ability. Uh, they also gained some visibility. Uh, so for, uh, for Zoe, for example, to, who was a, a chemist at the University of Birmingham when she did a, a, our event in 2013, that allowed us to get suddenly more invitation for talks. Uh, suddenly she got uh, invited to join some, uh, some committees. If you look at two other, Deborah, or three other, Deborah, Tamsin and Nicola, Deborah is the same. She got more outreach, active, uh, outreach opportunity. Uh, she got asked to join the Athena Swan Committee and chair various meetings. But uh, a lot of our speakers, what they also highlight is the fact that they, they gain access to a community. They feel less alone in a way. They, can, they, they connect, and it's a, a different way of networking with people in your field. And currently, we're talking a, a network of more than 500 people. Um, so many of them uh, uh, start to talk something else than just equality and diversity. Uh, it has also an impact on the older one so, and the, the more senior one. So if you think about Hillary, um, she was the, uh, uh, the pro VC at Swansea. She came in 2013, stood on our sub boxes, loved the idea, came back to Swansea, created a Swansea event, then went in various places, including Canada, and start to systematically encourage people to create sub box events over there. So we, we gained some incredible ambassadors and people that also understand, or, or, or thanks to their participation in the event, understood that, that uh, there is something to do about uh, trying to talk about those issues in different ways. And, and I want to make it clear that our sub box speakers only talk about their work on their sub boxes. They don't talk about uh, equality and diversity. They only talk about what they research on what they do. Uh, or someone like Naomi, who is based here at Imperial. Uh, again, she was our first round of speakers. She was one of the first in 2011. And when she came on the sub boxes, she wasn't really exactly enthused by the idea of talking to people and having to engage. She discovered what a blog was. Uh, she wrote a blog for the independence through us, and I remember her, her being worried about how to write a blog and then at the end completely enjoying it. It's exactly the same with the Subbox experience. She wasn't so sure about going on the Subbox and at the end of the hour, you have to help them get out of the Subbox and, and most of our speakers are actually like that. Um, so although it is frightful, once you do it, you love it uh, because it, it creates a completely different connection and way of talking about your passion. And now, what's interesting when I talk about Subbox is um, so as, as you've seen in my introduction, uh, as uh, how I was introduced, I'm, I'm an academic, I do research. Um, most people would come to me and say, but why? Why would you give your time to this? And uh, of course, if you see it now, seven years later, with all those medals, etc., you think, oh yeah, that's a good way to do it. But we didn't start like this. <laughs> we started with one event having to find some funding, having to, to explain to our line manager, supervisor, whoever we, we worked with, that this was a good idea. And then they couldn't see the good idea. I mean, this doesn't link to papers. It doesn't link to, it doesn't feed into ref. It doesn't give you grants. I mean, ultimately it did, but at that time it didn't really. So why, why would you put your energy? Why would you deviate from what's expected out of you when you're an academic to do something like this? And so if I was to answer that, so I started to think about it, and I said, yeah, I can tell them about the leaky pipe and the fact that you get all those women that get there, and then, and then suddenly it drops, 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 and at high seniority level, we don't, you don't have that much. But I thought, <coughs> making it dry isn't going to inspire you or, or make you think. So I just take a more personal approach, <laughs> an approach where we come back to the fact that before being this, I was this. I, I was five-year-old. I was a 13-year-old. I have gone through a different different stage in my life, I had to build a career in science. 
And going through this, I went and experienced various things. And I thought what we could do is to introduce my motivation for working on Subbox for so many years uh, through a lot of various key moments that are best described with statistics for anyone that would doubt some of the stuff I'm going to try like. So let's start with uh, the early years. Uh, when you're a young woman, uh, and, and you may or may not be interested in science, what's for sure is that society around you has an expectation about what a scientist looks like. This is a study that L'Oreal did um, and asked people in various countries in Europe plus uh, in China to describe the gender they associate with being a scientist. And then, as you can see, on average, 70% are associated more with a, a man than a woman. If you go to a country like China, it's even more. So society has a view on what a scientist looks like. And actually, it's reinforced to children in their early years all the time. Now, you might think that this cliche of that old guy with a lab coat is so 70s. I mean, I might have experienced it, but surely the kids nowadays don't experience this. This is, was sent to my three-year-old <laughs> uh, maybe four weeks ago. Uh, and, and as you can see, the cliche is still there. Uh, it's an old man uh, with a lab coat, and that's doing science. Now, if you think about this, it's actually no surprise that if you ask a child, a young child, to draw a scientist, they will come up with something like this, uh, which is an old man with a lab coat. And that less than 0.05% of the children will, uh, of 5 to 11 will actually draw a scientist as a woman. That has some implication, much more than just, well, they, they, you know, it's, it's an image issue. Well, no, it's more than an image issue. Science associates with being smart in kids' minds, and actually in adults' minds too. Now, if you keep on reinforcing the fact that men are smart because they do science more, their scientists are men, what you end up having is six-year-olds thinking that they are, six-year-old girl thinking that they are not smart enough to do science. And therefore, they are also more likely to not get uh, engaged with the activity that they perceive as being for the people that are smart. So at six by six, you already detect the, the impact of those cliches on, on individual choices. And now I, I, and I can, I mean, I relate to this. I'm hoping that some of you relate to this too. Those perceptions and those ideas of early on anchored. I mean, I pick up my kids, I have a boy and a girl, and you will always have someone say, oh yeah, she's a girl, she does like this. Yeah, oh, it's a boy, so it's much more to do like this. It's all the time, all the time, all the time. Uh, and it continues at school years. So um, here is a really interesting um, uh, study that was reported by the campaign uh, for science and engineering in their uh, diversity report in 2014. I just went around the UK and asked parents what they really expect their daughters and their son to have as a career. And as you can see, uh, if you have a son, you'd love them to be an engineer or a scientist, a tradesman or, or sportsman. But if it's a girl, well, maybe more a teacher or a lawyer, as a hairdresser, a fashion designer. So you can, you can spot the difference straight away. And you might say, well, it's parents. Who listens to parents? Kids listen to parents. Another uh, report from Accenture showed that more than half of the students asked as to what was the key factor to choose one, to retain one field over another, to choose for one course or leaving Another was actually the parents. So parents are key influencers in a kid's decision to engage with science and technology. Um, uh, on top of that, you have the teachers. Now, we all expect teachers to, to not be biased, but that's not, that's not exactly true. Uh, again, a recent uh, report uh, by Accenture, uh, this time covered, for example, by the uh, Independent uh, just a month ago, show that 57% of the teachers will actually openly admit that they have some stereotypical view about what young girls and, and, and boys uh, prefer to do and what, whether they like science or not. And uh, an experiment that was reported in a, in a, in a paper two years ago uh, showed that beautifully. And they just looked at how teachers rate performance of 11-year-old uh, in mathematics. And what they showed that even though the performance is the same, the, the, the learning behaviors are the same, 
uh, teachers on average will rate the girls' achievement lower. Uh, so it's no surprise, again, that uh, if you ask school children about their perception of science, uh, a lot of the young women in secondary school children will tell you that it's good, but it's basically a subject that is a bit niche and more suited uh, to males than females. So let's say that you, 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 got, you, you didn't get too much affected by all of this as a young child and through your school years, and you still decide to actually try out a science uh, degree at university. What, what kind of environment do you experience then? Well, the first one is that uh, you, it's, it's becoming a little bit more tense. You see your, your peers are more likely to see you as a girl less competent than other peers. And again, a study uh, two years ago showed that uh, if you just look at a selection of, of classroom, the most renowned students that, that were known to be good and known to be non eligible were more likely to be male. If you uh, look at something that, uh, uh, on the good side, we're all starting to talk more and more, uh, uh, you also have quite a, a difference in the level of harassment, <laughs> um, both uh, normal harassment and sexual harassment experienced by, by uh, boys and girls or young men and young women at university. And I've put that under the university section, but I could put that later on into establishing a career. Um, so this is uh, some numbers. They are quite difficult to get those numbers. But in the US, they were able to show that one out of three students actually uh, experienced harassment. And something that did at least worries me is that uh, less than 50% of the women felt secure in and around campus uh, from stalking. So um, you get harassment, you get undermined. Uh, harassment, you might think, oh, this was the US. Uh, surely in the UK, it's not the same. It's US a bit different. Well, no. um, this was actually in the BBC two days ago. Um, uh, it was a, a coverage of a survey organized by a student that was actually raped. Um, and she was interested to find how prevalent the problem is in the UK. And again, this, this is a very difficult number to access. Whenever there, there is some estimation, they are estimated to be low. So she went around, organized a, a survey through social media, got over 4,000 respondents for, uh, from 153 UK university, with most of them reporting uh, that they had experienced sexual harassment or assault. And what was particularly worrying is only 2% of that survey uh, actually reported that, uh, if they had reported that to the university, that only 2% were happy with uh, the way the university uh, and the whole process uh, uh, went. And then um, you might be also perceived differently by your supervisors. Um, so that's, again, very difficult to, to, to pick up. Uh, but um, the Dutch and colleagues two years ago did this really nice analysis of the type of recommendation letter that you get as a girl, as a, as a young woman, or as a, a young man who just got a PhD and is trying to find a job post-PhD, and showed uh, quite nicely that if you were a woman, you were less likely to receive excellent recommendation from your supervisors. So that's all the scholar and the education bits. And you might still decide, as I did, uh, to go through with it um, and actually go for trying to establish a career in science. So, so what happens then? Well, the first one is that, and that's the one I, I probably relate the most to, is that you're more likely to be seen as less competent. Um, and again, they demonstrated that fabulously well in a PNAS paper in 2012. They wrote some CV and they interchangeably changed the name on that CV, with some being men, some being women. And what they showed is that if it was a men name on the CV, it was more likely to be seen as hireable, uh, to have a higher starting salary, and then to get more monitoring opportunity. You're seen as less, more, or as less competent, and if you are seen as competent, at some point, you always have to prove that this wasn't just a random mistake or that you got, it, you got lucky and you were right for once. <laughs> so you always have to show that, that 
your performance, your, your, your ability are there to stay and are, are, are characteristics, is a characteristic of you. Um, and so and this has been shown for years, actually. There was a, a, a study in 97 that showed that women needed to be uh, 2.5 times as productive uh, than men just to receive the same competence score. Um, something that is quite relevant uh, given the, uh, the gender gap uh, pay law reporting that is about to come up next month. But yeah, in science, women are also less paid. Uh, it's true in the US, uh, with on average 28% and quite some uh, difference uh, according to the different type of discipline. If you're in physics, that difference goes way bigger. And not just the US, in the EU, it's exactly the same, around 25%, it's actually bigger. And if you go in the UK, a recent survey by New Scientist for 2007 also report that on average, we're talking 20% 20 20 paid less. Um, something that comes up as a result of all of this is that you're less likely uh, to have your scientific achievement be celebrated. The plenary, as most of you would have suspected, are more likely uh, to be men. Men have been uh, uh, estimated to receive, uh, uh, on average, of up to five times more media contact to talk about their science or to talk about, to, to, to comment on various scientific issues than women. Um, what's, what's a bit funny today, given that I'm giving a talk on this and not on what I do, is that uh, as a woman, you are more likely to be applauded by, for your work on equality and diversity than you are for being applauded and give big speech about your actual science. <laughs> um, and then the men win a higher proportion of scholarly award, uh, while women tend to, have, uh, to win a higher proportion of teaching award. Um, and that's, I mean, every year this kind of topics come up when we talk about the Royal Society Fellow and who was nominated and who wasn't. Um, on top of that, as a woman, you go through life and experience different things. You may or may not want to have children. In all cases, this is something that will systematically come on the table whenever you go through interview or whether you, you apply to various things. There is a strong assumption, which has been reported by many, uh, that for some reason, women might become less competent and also less committed as soon as they have children. Uh, and if you don't, oh, that, that you must be a bad mother. So that's this old bad stereotypes that go with that. Um, uh, as soon as you may suggest that you want to have children or have children or get pregnant, you get some form of direct discrimination that sometimes goes from a nice place, nice put like this, <laughs> which is people assuming that she's so busy, she probably doesn't need this. I'm sure we can make favor and not give her that appointment as an associate editor or on that committee that is quite prestigious. Uh, and if you don't want to have children, you still have to pay the price because at, at the core is the assumption that up until menopause, you're a liability because you might want children at some point, which means that you're more risky to employ uh, on project, for example. Uh, something that has been uh, uh, described as the maternal and motherhood penalty. Um, it can be quite a, a lonely world uh, when you're a woman in science trying to establish a career because the one above you don't systematically engage with you. Uh, and that's a, a syndrome called uh, queen bees. So basically women that have had a harsh time building a, a career in science uh, prefer to distance themselves from the early career women so that they don't get associated with the stereotype that goes with being a woman. So that's what's called the, the stereotype threat. Uh, and so uh, women at higher position are equally likely uh, to be biased against women and to see them as less committed or less competent. Something that I think is, is not recognized and it's not because you're a woman that you're not biased against women. It, it's a completely wrong assumption. Um, there's uh, something to, to say about walking a tightrope. So science is a human activity, which means you, ev you evolve in community all the time, and people have expectation. Um, and the tightrope relates to the fact that if you fit the feminine box, well, clearly you must be not that competent. But if you don't fix that and, and, and you're seen as too masculine, then you're most likely 
unbearable and full of testosterone. And uh, that was nicely captured by, uh, by uh, uh, this report, which looked at uh, different ethnical background and how they experience uh, working in the STEM community. And as you can see, this is particularly prevalent uh, for um, a white and Asian woman, not so much uh, for black, but the, those three in particular reported to, to be pressurized uh, to play a, a stereo, uh, to be a stereotype, either uh, the office mother or uh, the dutiful daughter. And all in that is well encapsulated, at least for me, uh, 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 with this article that was published in 2013, which I, I couldn't believe when, when this was published. It was, it was something about looking at the future of ecology, which is the, the, the discipline where I work in. And basically, it was based on a survey of American uh, conservation biologists and then what are the expectations and what they like, don't like, etc. The, the survey wasn't designed particularly well, um, but the authors thought that this was good enough to make some general recommendation where basically they explained that uh, why would you force those women to go into those prestigious universities because at the core of being a woman is at the core is to be a carer. And what they want is to teach, not to compete. No, no, no. So you should more, you can fix the whole gender issue by just letting be what they like, which is teachers, and the other one do the competency stuff. And that was their vision in 2013 for ecology. It's, yeah, I can't even describe how, how enraged is it. So, so when you ask me why I gave all those years, why I did some of my weekend, why my kids play on subboxes on a regular basis, why I tweet, why I learned word, words, uh, was it, um, why I, or how I learned to, uh, to deal with WordPress, and just, all of that is because I'm, I'm pissed off, mostly. <laughs> I've been pissed off for a while. I'm, I'm pissed off all the time. I'm pissed off because I had to experience that. But then I, I went to a new level of pissed off when I started to supervise students and know that they will have to go through all of this again and that nothing has changed. And then when I got a daughter, my head just blew. <laughs> I said, how am I going to have to see to prevent my daughter to go through all of this and not be able to be what she wants to be because others decide for her what she should be or how she should behave. So this is why, this has nothing to do with academia, nothing to do with grants and stuff, etc. It's because fundamentally I'm pissed off. Uh, and I think we should all be pissed off because this is not just a woman's issue. Um, if I'm being asked to be someone uh, based on a stereotype, then all of us do. And men as much as women. You can't be the dad that take a, a long parental leave because it's expected that you don't take your two weeks <laughs> that you might have. You can't, you're not expected to show different type of, of this or that. It, it, those stereotypes play to all of us. And so clearly, Subbox is not the solution to everything, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's Subbox personally, was my way to cope with me being pissed off because it gives me some positive vibes <laughs> about the community. Actually, you, you transform that bad energy into something positive. And clearly, there's a bigger agenda uh, about bringing cultural changes uh, inside and outside STEM to actually for the benefits of all of us. But what's important here is that we all have to play a role in this. Can't be fixed by subbox, can't be fixed by policy, can't be fixed by X, Y, Z. It's actually fixed by all of us uh, every day when we make decisions. You know, when you buy a toy to your niece, uh, when you give some recommendation to your daughter, when you interact with your peers at university, when, whenever you do anything, you actually have a responsibility because you might or may not push that culture and make it continue or actually push for a change. And that's the end of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't think there's any doubting the brilliance and capability and passion and pissed offness that, <laughs> we, uh, that you bring to the topic. We do have time for questions, uh, and so I would invite the audience to ask questions. But actually, one piece of research that Natalie didn't mention that we've come across recently, which is that after a seminar, if a woman asks the first question, then other women in the audience are much more likely to participate in the discussion. So. Given that it is International Women's Day, could I invite any women in the audience to ask a question? We have one here at the top. Thank you. <laughs> Hi.
Hi, um, I really enjoyed the talk and like finding out about soapbox science. I was wondering if you were doing any work or whether you'd like make um, you know events around uh, non-binary and genderqueer people in science. Yeah. So we have uh, we have broadened this to to include anyone that uh, um, identify themselves or f f basically relate to the soapbox ethos. So you don't have to be, uh, it's, it's open to transgender, it's open to gender fluid people if they want to, yeah. Um, but uh, I have to say that this, because it came out of our experience and motivation, we didn't, we didn't know how to, from the start, it came up as we started to discuss with more people and learn about the issue, but yeah. Thank you. More questions? Another question by a woman. The research is obviously correct. Thanks very much. I also appreciated your, your talk and your pissed offness, which was <laughs> great. Um, so I did mechanical engineering for my undergraduate many years ago, um, and interestingly enough, found that of the other female undergraduate students that I was closest to, we all had a parent who was an engineer as well. Yeah. Um, specifically at that time, we all had a dad that was an engineer. Mm. Um, what can you say about, um, I guess, I still have never figured out if it's because the stereotypes didn't stand for us, or if it's that, dare I say, you know, in our family we happen to have strong maths, or, um, it, you know, to what degree do students then take on a, a, or consider engineering um, because they just like math and science, or they don't consider it because of the stereotypes. I think, I think it's a difficult question because there's so many different aspects that ultimately shape the decision to go one way or the another. But I think stereotypes plays all the way. I mean, especially with the engineer. I mean, I don't remember, if you remember the, the campaign for science and engineering uh, report where I show what parents expect for, for their children. Engineer, well, you know, the difference between men and women is completely, is over the top, so um, so it doesn't surprise me that uh, um, there's those kind of problems. It's the same a bit with teachers. Um, not to say that uh, all teachers are the same, but there, there is an assumption that that girls might might struggle a bit more with technology and engineering. And certainly, uh, they have never done it. But I would I would love to see how stereotypes at the teaching level uh, varies according to math, biology, and physics and uh, engineering. Um, so, I, so what I'm trying to say is that it may or may not be a factor. I do think that there are girls that become engineer and don't have a dad that is an engineer. Uh, I do think that it helps when uh, you have um, parents that support you to, to, or encourage you to see the world differently than the, the world around you, if it makes sense. Yeah. It's a difficult one because I don't think there's an easy answer. Because a, a strong teacher can change anything. A strong parents can change anything. Yeah, brothers, sisters, sometimes friends, sometimes parents of friends. It, it all depends on, on the, the, how you latch on as a child to someone else and the, that relationship that you develop and how you see them as, as a mentor or not. Yeah. Next question. Um, so, if we're now tempted to take to soapboxes, how yeah. do we go about doing that? So, so, to participate as a speaker, all you have to do is go into that brilliant website, let's make it clear, <laughs> and you apply. Um, it's open to all. So, when we started, because we were unknown uh, the first two years, I think, we had to actually approach people and say, would you like to do it? Stuff. But now it's completely open, transparent process. Um, so, you missed it for this year. The deadline was uh, last month. Um, but from generally, uh, it's from mid-December to mid-February. Uh, you go on the website, you apply, and then local organizers for your event, so it depends where you apply, uh, make the decision on uh, the people that uh, they will put on their sub-boxes. Demands vary a lot. London, it's, uh, we receive over 100 applications every year <laughs> for 12 spots. Other, they have 14 for 12 spots. <laughs> so the likelihood is a bit different, but yeah, it's very easy. No. Uh, that's that response. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, what are more of your thoughts on the leaky pipeline um, with women in academia? Because from my perspective, it's kind of this self-fulfilling prophecy where 
you know, people are saying like, oh, like she probably doesn't want to do this, like, or like there, there is obviously like predominantly ma males in academia, and it, it, you can kind of see why women might feel uncomfortable about going into that kind of workspace because they'll feel insecure and they'll feel outnumbered. So, yeah, it kind of fulfills itself in the sense that women get to a certain point where they're like, oh, like I don't want to do this. You're right, like. I don't want to do this anymore because I'll feel outnumbered. So what are your thoughts on that? So, um, so the Athena Swan process uh, has changed a lot of stuff in the UK because it has started a conversation around this. So when I built my career, no one wanted even to acknowledge the fact that, <laughs> that this is a problem. Actually, they made some really nice study showing that if you're men, you're men, you're more likely to, to, to disregard that science and see it as wishy-washy bullshit type of thing. <laughs> uh, so Athena Swan, what, one thing that they did, on, they created the award and the committee and all the admin stuff here, but actually what they actually did is to orientate toward action. And so things are changing to some extent um, in terms of numbers, for sure, and, but that I, don't, I don't think this will actually is what you are after. What is changing is also the fact that uh, a lot of women are more uh, are more than happy now or open to the, uh, the idea of uh, acting as a, a mentor. So you're, you're less alone because you can talk about this and go to, even if it's that single woman, <laughs> you're more likely to be heard if you go to her because of the Athena Swan process. And what it has also changed is that, well, it's not super well represented here because on equality and diversity talk, most of the time you still have a, an enormous proportion of, of people attending that are women, but you start to have men coming. You start to have men, that those men in academia start to actually realize that they also need women. And they realize that this is not they need women for the sake of you because it's it correct. They have realized and more research shows that diverse working force work better. So if you have not only women, but also, you know, a, a diversity in ethical background, diversity in way to perceive the world, frankly, then you create a team that is much more likely to adapt to various problems. And that links beautifully with biology. Yeah, this is the whole thing. If you have diversity, that's why we, 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 we go on so much about biodiversity, because diversity is a way to react quickly to problems. And it, this is also true in science. Science gets more creative, more friendly, and works better when it's more diverse. So, so even though it feels like an empty space from time to time, and believe me, when I go, I go sometimes to workshop where I'm the only woman. I had people asking me to make coffee, thinking that I'm the PA of someone. Yeah. <laughs> and it still happens. Yeah, and I feel as lonely as you feel I, at your level. I, it, you know, it doesn't really change. But what has changed is that things such as Subbox, I can then connect to 500 or now 1,000 women and say, they did this, yeah, 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 I had that too. And then you start to, you know, to process the, the, the little trauma but together. And then it gives you an, enough strength to move forward. Does it help? Yeah. Hi. Um, so, have you been able to quantify how Sobox has uh, uh, changed this perception at what ages? Like, so you approach the public, and forgive me if I have misunderstood certain things. Uh, so, you approach the public, you said trying to do it randomly without being organized or uh, in places that you're not expected to be. Uh, how uh, can you quantify? how you have changed the perception of these people and do you follow it up with certain people? At what stage is, do you think you impact their view? Yeah, so we, we've tried, of course. So we, we, we get them when they leave the event to try to get an idea about how, you know, uh, whether they, so, so we, don't, we, we don't want to make a big thing about the fact that it's just women to the public. Because what we want them is not to think, oh, it's a woman thing, it's a science thing. Oh, and did you notice, by the way, they were all women? But it's fine. You know, and that, so, so we don't want to, to, to push on that too much. Uh, so we are trying to get them at the end of the event, and we get some information, as you've seen, as to the impact on how they get likely to hear about science, etc. We sometimes have tried to follow up. <laughs> People don't want to, you know. And, and it's extremely difficult to relate one little event, three minutes, thinking to what has happened years after. What we have is a lot of uh, anecdotes. 
So the one that always gets me, so, sorry, but, uh, is uh, there was a little girl in Newcastle and uh, she was working, walking with her mom. Uh, and she stopped straight and said, look, mom, that's scientists and they're women. And then they, they, they looked and stuff, they interacted. And that girl said to one of the local organizers that it's the first time that she sees that a girl can be a scientist. And that, yeah, it's the only type of information that I can give you because it's super difficult to relate seeing something into years and years later. So you can't, you can't say you achieve loads. You can just get those little gold dust. Uh -huh. and, that and makes how you. How do you see you can achieve load? Because that's fantastic. The uh, being present, being visible, um, is excellent. It's not enough of it, absolutely. Uh, but how can we move to the next step to get more girls? Um, like your daughter or my daughters into sciences, get them to carry to th through uh, higher education and um, um, high school, and then choose uh, to, to come to Imperial or to go and study sciences yeah. and uh, do more and more. So the question, I've answered that. I've put all my energy at that. So that I will return the question to you. What do you do to change that and take it to the next step level? What do you do to get those little girls? Because I, I know what I do. I do, I do try as on top of doing stuff. Yeah. But so, and, that, and that's not just you, you. So what do no, you all do? Me, yes. Because it, it, I can't carry. <laughs> yeah. We have to do it all together in this. Uh, so yeah. to, to put it into the next level, we all have to do something about it. So no. are you in participation with, and sorry, I don't mean to monopolize the question, are you in participation with other organizations that then they go grassroots and they work with schools or they yeah. work, you yeah. are? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we, well, they come to us, we come to them. I mean, this is something that is working well and it creates network and women that do sub generally or STEM ambassador generally all linked to the art and one committee generally. So that network is a... Is a is, is a culture <laughs> that goes and stuff. But it doesn't solve everything. Uh, just let's be clear. This is something that as, as, a, as a community we will all have to address together. Um, but yes, um, I, I agree. <laughs> a question here on the right as I look at the room. Hi. Um, I was wondering, you know there's a massive sort of imbalance, uh, sort of gender imbalance, difference in gender imbalance between like, um, you know, some parts of STEM subjects and some other parts of, you know, for example, life sciences, medicine yeah. is much more equal than in, for example, engineering. Do you, when you're doing your soapbox work, do you sort of try and address that in any way? Do you put like an emphasis on the engineering side or the physics side or anything like that? Subbox is a super flexible format, yeah? So nothing prevents from, uh, from uh, having suddenly a special subbox on engineering or uh, um, uh, suddenly trying to promote here and there. There's, there's possibility. To us, it works best when you have all the science together because the general public, which is the people we're trying to talk to, they really like being able to hear a bit about engineering and then uh, move into biology and then uh, move into physics. So it gives them an experience that's bigger. Um, we always try to have the widest representation for each event. So if we have engineer applying, then generally there will be an engineer in one of the subbox events. What I would say is that the engineer needs to apply more. <laughs> um, Not up to me, I'm medicine. Uh, oh yeah, medicine we do too. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> uh, c actually, can I ask just a little bit about the, me the mechanics of it? Do you expect the scientists to have a little spiel presentation ready or do you simply rely on the public coming and asking questions? No, we actually train them. So uh, we have uh, training events. Uh, so once we select our speakers, uh, we try to bring them together so that they start to know each other to start with. And then we give them two or three hours of training as to what works, what doesn't work. And we have loads of experience by now as to what works and what doesn't work. So we give them tips so that they, they a little bit less stress about it. So uh, you mentioned that the comedian Robin Ince yes. helps you do your training. So yeah. what tips does Robin give to your volunteers? Uh, <laughs> I think so. What's cool with Robin is that uh, he's, um, he adapts to whoever he has in front of him. So it depends on the question he receives uh, on the tips that he actually gives. But I think what um, what he always says is that uh, uh, people worry too much about the details. Uh, they, absolutely, they go wanting to explain the exact purpose of their research, 
well, actually, uh, that's not the point at all. You can relate it to a big, 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 wider uh, problem and talk about that wider, even if it's not exactly your research, it doesn't actually matter. What matters is to talk about the problem and talk about way to address it. And then if people want to delve in, then you have the expertise to delve in if you want. But if, to, if you want to catch people, you need to, to take it to a, to, to a broader first rule of engagement. So that's the first one. And I think the second one I always say is then not to fear question or not to fear dialogue, to actually give them as much opportunity as possible to, to talk to you. Uh, by, for example, starting your talk with a question or, or making people do stuff, which works well, so chains and stuff, etc., so that you, you get them to move with you. And once you're there, then you can actually start a conversation. Uh, we have a little bit of time left. We have a question at the back. Hi, thanks for a really inspiring talk. I was just wondering, if you have so many applicants in London, why don't you have more events? And because we don't have the money. <laughs> so um, so to, London is a specific event because you, in most places in London, you have to pay for, uh, to, to actually deliver an event. You can't just come with your subbox and say, ta-da! They, they, they charge you with stuff, and they charge you quite a lot of money. Uh, so we have, from the start, uh, secured uh, some funding stream to, to do subbox through Loyal for Women in Science. That was our first sponsor. Um, for London, but we've never been able to, uh, to, well, and maybe it will come in the future, to get people that actually provide money for a second event somewhere and, and get the budget and uh, the possibility to do that. One final question, burning on the tip of your tongue. Uh, okay, I'm not seeing any hands, so uh, I will just uh, wrap up then. and uh, Let me thank Natalie for um, a truly uh, wonderful talk. Soapbox Science is clearly a very inspiring and important initiative. It's clearly one piece of a much wider uh, canvas of work that still needs to be done to address the issues of gender equality in STEM and, of course, um, uh, across the rest of society. I realized as soon as I sat down, having done the introduction, that the one thing I failed to do yet again was to explain who I am. Um, and although I'm known in this department, in the Department of Life Sciences, which is my home department, um, I'm also the Assistant Provost for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. And I've been appointed since the beginning of October. And uh, my appointment and the creation of this position uh, I hope represents uh, a signal that uh, the university is taking the issue of diversity, of gender equality, uh, in, um, uh, much more seriously. And there's lots of work going on at the moment to try and um, address many of these issues and hopefully to increase um, the pace of change. We have certainly seen quite a lot of change at Imperial College over the last 20 years, but I think there's still scope to pick up the pace in many cases. And, Natalie referred to some of the troubling issues to do with both recruiting students, with recruiting and retaining and promoting um, staff, with providing a culture, a working environment where people can feel safe, and all of those aspects um, we will be working on in the uh, years to come. We started actually, just to give you a little bit of information, there's a working group revising and reviewing all our policies on dealing with cases of sexual harassment and what we're hoping will come out of that is a set of policies that are much more robust and a, um, a, a way of communicating um, with the staff which enable people to report any instances um, that may have caused them concern and to give them the confidence that the university will deal with such matters um, efficiently, sensitively, confidentially and um, robustly. Um, my email address is easy to find, so please feel free to contact me if you have any queries about any issues of that. We also have a, an Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Strategy Group at the very top of the college. It's chaired by the Provost, and feeding into that is an Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Forum. And within a week, we will have a web page on the college website for the forum, which has just been convened. And the forum I see very much as a listening post for any issue around this agenda that people might have concerns about or ideas about uh, for things that we might be able to do better. So please watch out for that. We will try and advertise it as widely as possible. Uh, and 
as Natalie said, you know, this is a job for all of us, it's not just for me, even though it's in my job title. Um, it's something that really all of us must try to uh, take some share of responsibility for if we are to make uh, the university and the world um, a better place. But um, thank you very much to Natalie for a wonderful contribution to that ongoing effort. Uh, and please join me in showing your appreciation.